Institute again. So um, the title of my talk is uh, Local Eigenvalue Statistics for Random Regular Graphs. And, all, and this is a joint work with uh, Zhao Yang Wang, who is a really brilliant uh, graduate student at Harvard, and uh, Antti Knowles and Hong Zai Yao. So first, let me. I, I will skip uh, most of an introduction in this audience, but let me at least say what the what the model is. Um, so the model uh, A is uh, just the adjacency matrix. Um, of a uniformly chosen um, random regular graph. Yeah, I, yes, I, I will say, I will explain. These are labeled graphs, I, I will explain. So the, so the graphs look like this, if you, if you like. I guess this would be, this would be 1, d is equal to 3, n is equal to 8. In this example, every vertex has a label, so 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. And if you fix n and d, this is, there's a finite set of such graphs. And so this is just the, un, the measure so that gives uh, equal. Is the coordination number That's right. Yes, that's right. And uh, it turns out the, the correct way to normalize this matrix is to divide by square root of d minus 1. If you, if you do that, so when I talk about the eigenvalues, I'll talk about the eigenvalues of, of h. It doesn't matter. So, so the a is just zero if you have an edge. Right. And it's a symmetric matrix, 0, 1, 1 if there's an edge, 0 otherwise. Right. You could take it to a box and have the same Yes, it's the same thing. Um, OK, so maybe the most uh, basic result is the following. If you take the, the spectral measure, then it, it's uh, well known and uh, not hard to show that it converges to a deterministic measure. Whose density is as follows, and this is sometimes called the uh, Keston McKay law. And in particular, as n goes to as, as the degree d goes to infinity, it goes to the semicircle law. And then, okay. Yes, this is the yeah. So this is a statement. Very coarse level. Right? Yes, this is a statement of weak convergence. So. That means uh, is that if you look at any interval here, say of order one, then the number of eigenvalues in that interval is epsilon times n, oh, is the is the area under the curve times n. So this is a statement about uh, macroscopically many eigenvalues. So for h, you have the you have mean zero, or you, you no, it does doesn't have mean zero. So there's there's of course there's one eigenvalue that's um, that's trivial, which is the constant one. So it's somewhere outside the support of this this law. In fact, uh, so this is this statement is weak convergence doesn't see individual eigenvalues, so you don't see this one here. Yeah. So you. You would have spectrum in between them. Well. OK, so, so what we're interested in is, uh, is individual eigenvalues, or the gaps between two eigenvalues, say, correlation functions of, uh, of individual um, eigenvalues next to each other. Um, 
And uh, so there's been uh, a lot of progress on in this uh, kind of question for matrices with independent entries, which this is a model which does not have independent entries. And uh, uh, we're definitely making use of those, those techniques. And so let me say a few words um, about, about this. So this is two. It's also appropriate uh, this this place, which is the, the to to say a few words about the Dyson Brownian motion. So what is it? So we start with any matrix H. So say uh, the random regular graph, but it could be anything. Could be deterministic. So let's call let me call this H of zero. Any matrix, uh, then you can uh, let the entries of H um, think of an uh, ev uh, evolve according to, um, let's say, independent Brownian motions up to the symmetry constraint. And in fact, um, it's convenient uh, to take an ornstein uhlenbeck version. This is um, centered. Now the invariant measure is, uh, is, a, is a Gaussian uh, matrix. And um, so I haven't said what dB is. So dB is the The standard Brownian motion on the space of um, symmetric n by n matrices uh, with, with real entries, say. So this is a, this is a linear space, and there is a the natural in our product on the space is um, trace a b for two matrices and um, so there's a standard gaussian measure on this space once you fix the inner product which is the gaussian orthogonal ensemble and there's a standard gaussian process associated to it which would be this one so i, I can just imagine the matrices undergoing the matrix elements undergoing each individually that's right so that's right so in this case uh, if you um, up to the symmetry constraint, every every entry is under independent Brownian motion. Um, and then, what's well known is that the that the eigenvalues um, satisfy a, a closed system of of stochastic differential equations, uh, which which reads like this. This is uh, the Dyson Brownian motion. You get this, for example, by apply applying the Ito formula. Um, this. Um, now, what um, the, signi the significance is so, what um, Dyson essentially predicted is that uh, eigenvalues reach their equilibrium on, on two scales, basically. If you look at global scales, say, the global eigenvalue distribution, then this equilibrium is reached on time scales of order one. And this is, in fact, easy to see. Um, on the other hand, if you're looking at, at local statistics, let's say the gap between two eigenvalues, say, away from the extremes, then this local equilibrium should be reached much faster on time scales uh, one over n. Uh, indeed. So let me let me bit, be a bit more precise. So this this is by now essentially a theorem, and let me let me state um, theorem. And in, in this form, it's due to uh, Landon and Yao. 
but it, it relies on uh, numerous uh, previous developments. Let me in particular put Erdős and Yao, and I'll say a few words about this uh, towards the end. Um, this, the, the theorem is the following. Uh, suppose that uh, near some uh, E0, uh, the uh, spectral measure of H0 has a density on scale n to the minus 1 plus delta. So more precisely, what do I mean? Um, I mean that, say, there is constant c, um, little c and big c, such that the imaginary part of the Steeltrus transform, uh, so I, I'd say what it is. So here. Uh, S of Z is the Steertrus transform of the eigenvalues of the original matrix. Um, the imaginary part is, um, looks maybe somehow like this. For every eigenvalue, there is a peak, and the width of the peak is roughly the imaginary part uh, of, of Z. And so this holds for for E near um, E0, say, in an interval of n to the minus 1 plus epsilon or 2 epsilon or so, and for eta at least uh, n to the minus 1 plus, uh, plus delta. So this is what I, what I mean uh, by, by a local density. Eta is the imaginary part. Eta is, that's right. Eta is the imaginary part. So, I, so I'm always writing z as e plus i eta. Thank you. And so, so is this Z really E plus I epsilon or something? Yeah, E plus I eta. E I plus I eta, yeah. Yeah, so this, this statement basically means that, that this statement here holds for n to the minus 1 plus eta. This is roughly what it means. So that's a very... So this is a much finer. This does not follow at all from, from, uh, from, from the weak convergence. Um, Oh, so, so this was the assumption. I haven't said what the conclusion is. Just some density, I'm not saying which density. Yes, it doesn't, doesn't matter precisely what. It doesn't have to be a semicircle. Some density. It's not, not important what it is. So in fact, this kind of bound is enough. Uh, then, um, local statistics, and let me be a bit. Uh, uh, maybe a bit vague here, so let's, let's say the gap between two eigenvalues uh, contained in this interval near e, e0. So there's an interval near e0, uh, and for, for a gap that's contained in this eigenvalue, this is what I mean by local statistics, Time n to the minus one plus epsilon. So yeah, what? So this gives you universality up to a, a minor averaging, yeah. I suppose. Is that right? Well, so well, no, no, there's no averaging yet. It just means that yeah. uh, whatever matrix you start, what could be complete could be deterministic, yeah. as long as you have a density on this uh, smaller scale up to, up to this epsilon. Then after time, n to the minus 1 plus epsilon, under this Dyson Brownian motion, the statistics are already the same as of that of the GOE. And uh, so if we're interested in random regular graph, what this theorem means is that we need to understand the inter we need to understand two things. One is does the random regular graph have a local density on this scale? And second, what happens in the time interval from 0 to 1 over n minus, to the 1 minus epsilon? This statement basically says that everything, provided you have a, a local density on the scale, 
every, all the interesting things happen in this short time interval. Yes. Sorry? Yes, so that's, is this, is this that's right, yes, yeah, yes. yes. So these are the two points we need to understand. OK, I'll, I'll increase my font size. I'll increase my font size. <laughs> oh, OK. Yeah, so uh, I just summarized what I said. Or I just wrote down what I said earlier, that first theorem is deterministic and H0. It applies, it applies to it, this doesn't anything. It doesn't depend on, on the model of the matrix. Uh, but if we want to apply it, we need to understand for a given model of the matrix whether it has a local density yeah. and what happens uh, under dyson brownian motion in the, time interval, in the short time interval. Yeah. So uh, there's something um, you start with your favorite matrix, then you randomize it in this fastest way. Yes. Or you recover adjacent to matrices. Right, okay, so that, that's the part I will explain today. So. Basically, we have the adjacency matrix here, H0. That's the initial condition. At time and so these are always random initial conditions, otherwise you couldn't do anything, right? Well, no, it's this, this theorem is deterministic. Yeah. All the randomness in this theorem comes from running the Dyson-Brownian motion. After time 1 over n, you have, a, you have a bit of a Gaussian, and that's enough. That's what this theorem says. As long as this is, is Yes, so as long as this condition holds, it's a deterministic condition, as long as it holds, uh, after time 1 over n, um, you have these Wigner Dyson statistics. So, in what, so in, uh, thank you for the question. So what it means is, really what we'd like to do is compare the adjacency matrix at, at time 0, this is the random regular graph, with a GOE, which is at time infinity. Right? This is what we'd like to see, those two have the same statistics. What this theorem says is it suffices to go to time 1 over time n to the minus 1 plus epsilon. If we can, com can compare h naught with this matrix and we have the local density, then we're done. So, so this, is, this is the first item. Uh, well, the first item is we need to local density, otherwise this result isn't valid. And the second item is we still need to understand what's happening in this time interval. And that's where, where we see more what, how the model comes in. That's where the discrete nature of or the constraints and all this will, will be seen. Yes? Yes, uh, I, I guess there is. Uh, yeah, there certainly is. Maybe, um, maybe we can talk about this after the talk so that I can get to the, yeah. to the main points, and then we, I, I'd be happy to go into more details here. OK. So maybe let me state um, what our results are, which basically corresponds to these two points. The first one So in 
our, our results hold if D is growing with the number of vertices um, in uh, so 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 uh, let me st let me state in which way. So if d is at least log n to the fourth, and maybe less than n to the two thirds, then um, we have the following conclusions. Um, the first one is um, The, spec the empirical spectral measure converges uh, to the semicircle law on all scales at least um, psi squared over n. So uh, it's 1 over n up to the log. And the eigenvectors vec are delocalized in the sense that if you take any eigenvector v, its infinity norm is smaller by a factor psi over square root of n compared to its L2 norm. So this is, um, this is the best uh, bound up to the psi that, that could possibly hold. And um, so I haven't. So so certainly the local density we need for this, the eigenvectors will be crucial to understand the short time interval. For that, we really need the understanding of the eigenvectors. So in the second theorem. Um, we need uh, these these assumptions are somewhat tech. That's right. Sorry, I should have said then for the random d regular graph, and all of this holds with very high probability. So for so when we continue interrupting yes. the uh, this uh, the Mackay effect of Mackay yes. is deterministic in the sense that you can actually say that for most psi it happens and gives a condition. Yes. Uh, is there something like that for eigenvectors? I mean it's um, so the so when you say the keston mckay law is deterministic, I think what you mean is that if you take an infinite tree, then its spectral measure is exactly no. the keston mckay law. No, 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 no. That, that's a limiting object. But you, if you take a, a family of, let's say, three regular graphs. Right. Number three, so oh, I see. You want to and do you want? Yes, I see. I see. Check that there are no short cycles, and then the spectral measure of these. Uh, well, of okay. Okay, so yeah, what what has been done is so if you if you under such deterministic conditions, what you get is not one over square root of n, but you get something like one over log n, and this was done by by um, so for for eigenvectors. Um, so I think. Brooks and uh, Linden Strauss, maybe some other people as well, but they have a basically they say fix D, take a D regular graph, then roughly the neighborhoods of a, of a certain radius are a tree, so you can compare to the tree, and what you get is more or less something like 1 over log n. S stated somewhat differently, but this kind of scale you can get from. Yes. 
I, I guess under these assumptions, maybe if you assume, I guess under these assumptions. I mean, it depends on. Yes. Yeah, but even so, even this uh, this assumes basically abs absence of cycle. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. But okay. So yeah. So and also using there's also other determin you get the sem or the Keston McKay law deterministically up to a certain scale but but not this scale you get something like 1 over log mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. so yeah so maybe i should have emphasized that really the the point is we're using the randomness uh, much more heavily than 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 previous results in this direction and and this way we can get much sharper uh, estimates and uh, I should have also mentioned that there is a number of previous results in this direction, which are basically some results that have log, uh, that are like 1 over log or so. Maybe, a, maybe a, I don't know. I guess I should have uh, given a list of previous results, but I didn't want to interrupt the talk with that. But, but yeah, there are there. OK. OK, so is that, is that OK? Oh. So the n to the two thirds is possibly not. This is uh, up to the log as optimal. This two thirds, not completely sure if it's optimal. It's certainly uh, hard with our techniques to go beyond that. Um, the reason is if so, if if you take the degree bigger than n, then certainly uh, there's no such graph anymore. So there has to be an there has to be an upper bound. Basically, sorry. Yes, that, 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 that's something you could ask. And our results don't apply to that case. But uh, it sh there, there are results. Um, so. Yeah, you could take n over 2. So there, there are results by, um, oh, I see, I see. so for, for dense graphs. Um, Oh, yeah, an erdos rheny graph, yes, yes. But so if you take, uh, if you take a regular dense graph, so then the dependency becomes much stronger, right? So there's a trade-off between how, how strong the dependence is and how strong, uh, how sparse the graph is. And both are kind of causing difficulties. So for, for dense graphs, there are results by uh, Tran, Wu. So actually, they, they don't need the dense. So this is regular graphs. And basically, they get scale. I think d to the minus 1 over 10, which is uh, if, if d is n over 2, it's, uh, it's not so bad. But it, uh, if, if d is, is, is small, then uh, it's, uh, in either case, it's not strong enough for what we need. Oh, right. I didn't finish stating this, this result. So here we need, yeah, so here we. Um, uh, have a, a slightly uh, a slightly stronger assumption on the degree. Uh, it's a technical assumption, but un under this assumption, we can complete this program and uh, apply that result and get the uh, um, So this is in, in the bulk, so the eigenvalues away from the extreme. And, it, and it's the gaps <coughs> and the uh, correlation functions in uh, energy average. I, I, I don't want to say uh, too much about the details for the moment anyway. But, but so if, if you're interested in the distribution of the gaps, that's covered, for example. No, no, for gaps you don't, um, there's no average needed. So um, the delocalization result still applies. Um, the bounds that I'm 
talking about here are, n are, are not optimal near the edges. Uh, that's, uh, I mean, somehow it's, um, it's a slightly different question. Um, that, in, in, a gap, yeah. in, the, in the lowest gap, do you, do you expect to see Tracy Widom or, or not? In, 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 in this case? I, th the question that's been I think that's what is expected, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think, yeah. Certainly, if the degree is large enough, but I think even for d equals 3 or so, I believe it's. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. From from our point of view, maybe the um, the delocalization of the eigenvectors is some somehow maybe the most fundamental uh, one. Uh, it's, it seems to us. Uh, at least that's uh, somehow on a technical level. That's what what uh, was always. If you know that. Uh, uh, you always need this. Uh, and so even if you, I think, if you want to understand the second largest eigenvalue uh, very well, then uh, you need to have a good understanding of the delocalization first. All right, so um, all right. So let me say a few, uh, I say a few words about what we um, what we do and um, to prove these these uh, results uh, maybe compared to uh, the independent case Um, no, I, I don't think that. No, no, no. What's the maximum gap? Then? What, what are you talking about? When you say the gap? Oh, so I mean, so if you um, if you look at two eigenvalues that are next to each other, um, so there they, there's n of them in an interval of order one. So the typical distance should be one over n. If you rescale this this distance by n, so if you take lambda uh, i plus one minus lambda i rescaled by n. Uh, so lambda is, a is a, an eigenvalue of a matrix that depends on n. If you take n to infinity, this has a limiting distribution, uh, which in principle is computable for the Gaussian case, and it's the same one for as as for, and, and it looks maybe some somehow like like this. It's non-Gaussian and uh, but certainly non-Gaussian, uh, but it's computable. OK, so um, maybe before telling you what we do in this case, I'll tell you what we don't do, which is uh, um, what you would do in the case where you have independent entries. So it, it, uh, it helps what to, um, to understand what we want to do. Um, in a matrix with independent entries, symmetric matrix, independent entries up to the symmetry constraint, what you can do is you can say condition on everything but the first row let me call the rest, rest maybe h1 you condition on this bottom right block and um, uh, let's say the the first uh, row and column independent of the bottom right block. Right? So then you can uh, use um, linear algebra. This is the, the sure complement formula. And the G is the resolvent of the matrix. So it's H minus Z inverse. And this is the 1, 1 entry corresponding 
to this, this, this one here. You, you can write an explicit formula. This, this is it. Uh, now um, the um, bottom right block, this one, is independent of these entries. So if you were to replace, so let's condition on the, on the green part. If you were to take, expectation, take the expectation with respect to the red part, what you'd get is the following. So first of all, this one is, is actually small. And then if you take the expectation with respect to the red part, this is what you'd get. You replace each of these, uh, only the, the off diagonal is zero, only the diagonal gives one over n. And um, by, by concentration inequalities, this is true with an error in high, pro high probability. And uh, in fact, you can remove the, the one here, which took out the first row again, since here there's a big average over all, all vertices. This, this uh, allows you to remove this one here. And so you get this kind of uh, equation. Uh, which relates the one one entry to the trace. Now, of course, you can do this not only you can replace one by any other vertex uh, and get the same equation. So first, um, let me sum up. So this is one z g one one plus g one one s. So s is the Stilchers transform, which I recall was the trace. The Green's function, you get this is approximately zero. This equation, now if you replace one by, say, any vertex i, and then you average over i, you get you get this um, self-consistent equation, which is equivalent to the semicircle law, essentially, on the global scale. Now, once you have it, you can plug it back into this equation. You can also get estimates for the, for the Green's function. So here on the diagonal, but you can also get off-diagonal entries. And once you have improved entries on the Green's function, you can actually use them in these steps I skipped here to get better bounds than, than, than you got just use, using nothing. And so once you do that, you can go down to the smallest scales uh, up, to, up to the epsilon. To the epsilon. So this is basically um, what uh, Erde, Schlein, Yao did. If for I were to do this for a band matrix, what would be, what would be uh, troublesome? Well, you, well, maybe we can again talk about it later, but I guess you, you don't get the complete, uh, it doesn't close. So now for the random regular graph, of course, um, the, the key difficulty is that uh, the first row is not independent of the bottom right block. In, for, in fact, it's deterministic if you know the bottom right block. There's only zeros or ones, and there's d of them. If, there, if you have d minus 1 or d, either way, you know what the last entry is. So, um, So um, t 
to, uh, to get around this, we use the idea of switchings. This is uh, something, uh, I guess, this is originally due to McKay. It's, it's well known in the, in the combinatorics uh, community. In any case, it's, it's basically the following simple observation. If you take a random regular graph and say you pick two uh, edges uh, at random, these two, you can, um, you can replace them in this way. And this will leave the uniform measure invariant. To be slightly careful, so for example, if you choose edges at random like this, then you have then you, then do nothing. If, now, if you did a switching, you could create cycles or something. So here, you do nothing. But um, that's it. And you can also do more 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 complicated versions. You can take three edges at random. And um, switch them in this way and also leaves the uniform measure invariant. So what, what we basically do is if you say consider a fixed vertex 1 and its neighborhood, say I'm drawing a 3 regular graph here, um, then we pair each, each of these um, Which colors didn't uh, red, blue? I guess um, we pair each edge with uh, which two uniformly chosen edges from the rest of the graph. So we get these these groups. So every edge is, is paired with um, two other ones, and then we um, then we switch them in, in this way. Mm. Not legal. Now, yeah, so so we start with we start with some regular graph. That's the white one. Okay. Then we select uniformly at random from the remaining graph the blue edges. Yes. And uh, for every so for every of these groups, we switch the white with the two blue edges for the red edges. Right, we basically do this operation here. We have groups of three edges, and we replace them by the red configuration. And um, so uh, one has to be slightly careful. So for example, if we choose the blue edges uniformly at random, you have to make so what it, it can happen that two blue edges uh, overlap, and then you have to, have to do nothing, and you have to do this in the correct way. But if you do, uh, this operation will, use, will leave the measure invariant. And so moreover, so, so in other words, the red graph is a new random regular graph. And we might as well work with the red graph rather than with the white graph. I and mean, that's what we do. So we use what the so far, so far, it hasn't changed anything. But it allows us to do the following. Now we, we can access the randomness of the first row in an effective way. We can just resample the blue edges, right? We have a probability space that consists of the original random regular graph plus the blue edges. And yeah, the blue edges are the ones not connected to the vertex. Okay. That's right. So we have a probability space. We've extended the probability space from the graph to, to include these edges as well. Now we can resample the edges the blue edges, and it's going to change the other graph, um, the red graph. Basically, if we resample the blue edges, what does that mean? Well, it means we're resampling the complete first row and also a bunch of entries in the rest of the graph. Right? Resampling. So. We cha change the point of view. Now consider the red graph. So this is we our. Start out with the white graph. We, you start out with the white graph, then you do this operation, you get the red graph, and from now on we work with the red graph because we know it's just as good as the white one, yeah. right? Well, it gives us the the it, it gives us the the operation to resample the blue edges, 
so it, it changes the red graph. So resampling the blue edges effectively resamples the first row of the adjacency matrix of the Okay, so that, that's, a, that's something I can explain. So the, we're fixing some vertex here. That's just yes. one. And it has a neighborhood. Those are the white edges. Right. And the blue edges, they're also in the white graph. I just denoted them blue because, they are, uh, because they're not in the neighborhood. Now they're just chosen. Disconnected from the white. That's right. So that's right. Disconnected from the vertex one. That's right. Yes, yes. but there are in the, in the white graph. You have the white graph. You choose the blue edges, which are edges in the white graph. Connected to some of these white edges, but not That's right. And then we do this operation. We get the red graph, yes. which is just as good as the white graph. Oh, maybe. So basically, uh, the three switching gives a little more randomness. Basically, so if you do the, if we do this two switching, we always have one vertex. That's uh, say say we do the switchings always with one one of the vertices being one. And the other one is deterministically say the neighbor of one, which if we condition on the graph is already deterministic, and then this edge is random. Uh, so let me call this one R and this one say A and A underline or so or maybe one underline. Now, if we do if we do the three switchings, uh, we get a bit more uh, independence. Um, we we get uh, every edge has an independent uh, 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 vertex, roughly. Maybe. Okay. So anyway, sam resampling the blue edges will resamp will effectively resample that red row, right? So corresponds to, so it resamples these entries here and a, a few entries somewhere in, in the rest of the graph. But uh, so these ones are pretty, uh, the, these ones are uniformly distributed in the rest of the graph and thus uh, for that reason much easier to control. So they, 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 will, they, they will not matter very much. On the other hand, it allows us to, to really resample the first row. And then you can do something similar here, not exactly the same. These ones, yeah. Well, um, basically, have yeah. yeah, we have to. We have to. So they, they will cause errors, will but these errors will be much smaller since these these ones they're uniformly distributed in the graph. So there, as you can, maybe you can imagine, there's a lot of averaging, and you can. Uh, so uh, you aren't trying to mimic this. But that's after, right. After, after this, uh, yes, yes. We 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 we're trying to mimic that. Uh, but we, uh, but we, we can't do it exactly because of the dependency structure. But the dependency is, is not uh, too complicated in this model. And we, we can do something that's fairly close. So you know, at first, I thought it was like your new Brownian motion. Model. Well, that's the next step. Okay. Uh, <laughs> uh, so, this is, so this is basically what we do to, um, uh, to prove the theorem, yeah, so theorem one. Uh, to Yes, you get the delocalization as well from this. Basically, you, um, once you have the, the diagonal of the Green's function, from that you can understand the delocalization. So, and, and this always comes together here. We first get an equation for the diagonal of the Green's function, then for the average, and then you, you go back. So this will give the delocalization and. Yes, yes. Yeah. That's right, yeah. This was this five, four, I don't.
So now, um, what, how do we go from, from here to the local eigenvalue statistics? So we still need to bridge this short time interval from time 0 to time n to the minus 1 plus epsilon. Right? And for that, we, we, can, we compare the, uh, the einstein uhlenbeck process with uh, uh, dynamics corresponding to these switchings. So if you let, say, psi i j k l be the difference of two adjacency matrix, matrices, say you have the h i j k l, and you subtract the switched one. So this is a matrix. So this each of these is a matrix of 0, 1, symmetric, so on. Then you can uh, define a, a, a dynamics which has a generator q. It acts on adjacency matrices. There is some normalization which you need to work out, but The, the dynamics generated by, by this generator corresponds to picking two edges uniformly at random, doing a switching if it's possible. So say, for example, if the configuration is like this, then do some graph on these, these four vertices. If it's something like this, then we do nothing more. So it's like a Dirichlet form, is it? Or yeah, yeah. So this is like a Laplace amount. Yeah, so this is, uh, this, uh, the, the uniform measure is reversible with respect to, to this dynamics. In particular, it's invariant under, under this dynamics, the uniform random regular graph. And we compare this dynamics to the, to the Dyson Brownian motion, if you like. So it's e to the, if I think about this, yeah. e, to the, e to the q, right? Uh, or e to the t q. Or That's right, yes, yes. Uh, yes. One's quite, they, they, don't, they, they don't look too much the same. Well, so basically, what you can do. If you so, uh, maybe I'll, I'll state. The, so in fact, what we do, we take the. Uh, so. There's one one remark I need to make. I talked about the Dyson Brownian motion first, but we, we need to make one change to it. It's and an, so. Every uh, random regular graph is, in fact, a matrix that maps constant vectors to constant vectors. It's the trivial eigenvector. So, so we, we should really be working with that subspace. So it's, an, it's a symmetric element of, of this space. So an E is, is just a constant, constant vector. And this is still a linear space. Uh, it's, it still has a natural inner product, just the restriction of the standard inner product to the space. And, um, it has natural Gaussian measure on it, which is a, a GOE, even though in the standard coordinates it doesn't look like a GOE. Oh, so this is just symmetric, uh, symme symmetric matrices that map the constant vector to the constant vector. Yes, just just the that's right. Just the matrices that preserve that vector. Maybe I could have written this in a simpler way, but um, and with the standard with the restriction of the standard in our product, and there's still still a standard Gaussian measure on this. It's a form of a GOE, even though in the standard coordinates it, it doesn't look like one. It, uh, it has dependent entries in the standard coordinates, but if you change to a natural basis for this one, anyway, it's a Gau it's a Gaussian's independent of the coordinates. And so, and then we take this einstein uhlenbeck process on this space, and I take. Mean, that space with that generator, though. No, no, not yet. That that that'll come in a second. So here, let L so be. Got, so that's the usual one. That's the Brownian motion. Yeah, this is the Brownian motion one. So L F of H is the generator of the standard 
einstein uhlenbeck process on this uh, space. Right? It, um, it's basically it's just in different coordinates, what I talked Same about thing. before. Same thing. But it, you can write this in the standard basis of the original. Uh, right? And if you do that, it looks very much like this one. So this one also operates, of course, on, on matrices which map constants to constants. And um, so and this is, in fact, not, uh, this is uh, not. Mean, one is kind of discrete and the other is continuous. Is that the That's difference? right, yes. So. But basically, if you, if you imagine if you tailor expand this to high enough order and then you use the definition of what this actually is, and you use some elementary pro properties of the random regular graph, then uh, you, you can, uh, in expectation, these, these will look the same to, uh, to at least second order. Mm -hmm. So more precisely, if you take the, under the expectation of the random regular graph, yeah. you take QF of A, this is the same as under the expectation of the random regular graph, of L, it's now there's a capital F, so little f and capital F are related in a simple way. So f of A is, um, let me see, you, have to, you just have to put in the uh, rescaling somehow. I, I have to look it up. Anyway, there's a simple, simple relation. It doesn't matter. So if you, if you take these, then they are the same up to a, an error, which is, um, so maybe I'll put a minus here. Right, A is, so H is the, is the, is the reason. so basically I think, yeah, so this is what I wanted to do. And then uh, there is, Space is getting a little tight here. So this is, is it's not a very strong estimate. It says that in, in a fairly weak sense, in the expectation under the random regular graph, these two generators are uh, close in this sense. In fact, there's an N showing up here in this normalization. And this, the same kind of estimates also holds uh, not only for the random regular graph, but also along the einstein uhlenbeck process if you start with the random regular graph. Basically, it allows us to compare the two up to time uh, 1 over n. The time 1 over n is canceling this n. And then if d is, is not too small, this is, this is small. And uh, so I guess my time is almost up. But so to, um, to get the conclusions from this, you say you have, what you have to do is you have to take, a, say, a function phi that depends on the eigenvalues rescaled in this way. You want to apply this theorem to f, this, this function phi. One technical difficulty that you see when you do this is that the derivatives of the eigenvectors are fairly singular. Um, um, and um, um, so what you do need to, to actually apply this is some form of uh, level repulsion. Uh, to, uh, to bound the derivatives of the eigenvectors that they, uh, that you, some a priori information that they can't come too close. Um, in fact, the results, which I've er yes. In fact, the results that I've er erased, uh, erased here of Landon and Yao, uh, the key technical um, um, result in, uh, is that after time one over n, uh, to n to the minus one plus epsilon, uh, under the conditions that there's a local density, they do get a little bit of lever repulsion. Um, and then that actually, that. so that's after time one over n, but then actually using this lemma, you can pull it back to time zero. And then you, uh, then you have it, um, uh, you have it uh, from time zero on. So it's, a, it's not a strong estimate. It's a, it's a fairly weak one, but enough to control these, uh, these derivatives. Maybe I should. Um, this is maybe the uh, the the end of the the official yeah. talk. <laughs>